All right, well, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, esteemed guests and visitors, to the Via Lincoln Symposium. It's our interactive and performative experience where you get a chance to be a part of history. Um, before we begin, I'd actually like to take the time now to um, acknowledge that Cal State University Fullerton is built on the ancestral land of the Quiche region, also known as the Gabrielle or uh, the Tongva people. Uh, we honor their stewardship and cultural legacy of the land. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Javier Aguilarme for the ambassador and consul general for Los Angeles from Spain uh, for attending today. Uh, this event was made possible by the Cal State University of Fullerton uh, Phi Alpha Theta, the Students uh, uh, History 435 Spanish Civil War Lecture Course, and of course the California State University of Fullerton Department of History. Uh, I would also very much like to give special thanks to Dr. Maitana Gia. Without her, this program would not have been possible, so she's the one who brought this all together. Uh, today's presentation is focuses on the story of the American volunteers who fought in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, today we're going to learn why these brave men and women chose to trade away their peaceful lives to turmoil of war towards Spain. Uh, some of the names we're going to hear today are familiar to you, like George Orwell and Ernest Hemingway. Most of them you're not going to be familiar with, but that doesn't, un that doesn't play down their contribution at all to the conflict. Uh, the symposium is going to begin with uh, some accounts of some more predominant Lincolns, and then we're going to have a presentation for the Cameron Stewart Collection. Uh, this is this part of the school's collection from the archives. This was put together by a professor, uh, Cameron Stewart, who interviewed a lot of the veterans in the Lincoln Brigade, and a lot of his research is compiled here. The school is very proud to have this as part of our collection. Uh, since this presentation is discussing the Spanish Civil War, um, there may be some images in the presentation that some may find a little disturbing, just so you're aware. And at the intermission, I'm going to be turning over my uh, part of the presentation over to Byron, who will be introducing uh, the Lincolns that we will be ha having some of our students read, but also we will invite members of our audience to come on and be a good ticket. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I would like to introduce uh, Garrett Fritz, who's our first Lincoln. He's going to be reading for Major Robert Marion, one of the commanders of the Thank you. I am Major Robert Hale Merriman, Chief of Staff of the 15th International Brigade. I was born the son of a lumberjack in Eureka, California. The year was 1908. All my life, I have worked to advance myself. I put myself in school, from high school through graduate school, doing everything from woodcutting to funerary work. I even joined the Reserve Officer Training Corps to put myself through the University of Nevada. It was during my time in the university that I met Marion Stone, the woman who became my wife. We married as soon as we both graduated in 1932. In that same year, I returned to California, where I take a, a position as a graduate student of UC Berkeley, where I studied economics. The times were tough. The country was in the midst of a Great Depression. All around me was a specter of hunger and suffering. Factories were shutting down, forcing parents to cast out their children because there was no food to eat. While studying at Berkeley, I personally witnessed the Longshoremen Strike of 1934. My heart went out to those people who were struggling for an honest living, for better working conditions, and were being struck down. I saw that all the Western world was suffering this terrible economic downturn. But then I heard of something that gave me hope of a better future. Like so many others, I read about a place where there was no famine, where the ec economy was growing in spite of the global downward spiral. I had read about the Soviet Union, where the communist model alone seemed to be flourishing. I had read about new schools being built throughout this country. Millions of people lifted out of poverty, where there was enough food and families could stay together. Now, I never considered myself a communist, but I dared to hope that there might be a way out of the turmoil that had engulfed my country. So by 1935, I convinced Berkeley to grant me a scholarship to study in Moscow. With Marion beside me, we would spend eight months exploring the Soviet Union. I spent that time seeing new farms, mechanized equipment given to people to share from the government. I attended lectures at the top academies in Russia, some regarding politics, but mostly agricultural themes. During our time there, Marion and I made many friends, some of them Americans like us who come to Russia for a better future. We saw that future taking shape. 
Yes, it's true. I heard that things were not quite as ideal as I saw. There are rumors of mass starvation in the countryside, and that people would sometimes disappear. I cannot recall seeing this myself, but I suppose I didn't want to. But there was something else going on in Europe, something I could not ignore. I read about Adolf Hitler and Mussolini, how the fascists bullied people around the world, from Ethiopia to Czechoslovakia. I heard about the atrocities in Germany, people stripped of their rights and forced into prison camps. I saw the foreshadowing of another great war in Hitler's tyrants. Then I looked to Spain. Here was a democracy directly threatened by fascism, where fascist forces rampaged through the country, burning as they went, while the democracies of the world, including my own United States, did nothing. The world powers agreed not to interfere, despite Italian tanks trampling the countryside and German planes flying the sky. No support or monies came through for the republic. I knew something had to be done. So in 1936, I bid my wife farewell and made the long overland journey from Russia to Spain. I arrived in Barcelona to find there was already a battalion of American volunteers freshly arrived and ready to fight against the fascists. My ties to the Soviets and my two years of ROTC endeared me to the military forces of the Republic, and soon I was made second command of the Abraham Lincoln Battalion. I spent week tra weeks training these raw volunteers in all aspects of war I could think of, from digging trenches to maintaining weapons. I didn't feel it was enough, but a war would not wait. By the approaching winter of 36, Franco's forces were on the outskirts of Madrid, and the Republic needed troops to defend the city. I knew that the Republic was ill prepared, yet still I was shocked at the wretched conditions getting to the front. A full third of my soldiers didn't make it to the front when a truck driver took a wrong turn and was captured. We arrived at the Harama River. We had no shovels, and our weapons were a hodgepodge of mismatched equipment. Most of the rifles were older than the men carrying them and needed 14 different types of ammunition that were always in short supply. By contrast, we saw Franco's forces were well dug in and bristling with the most up-to-date weapon. Republican command continually gave me suicide orders to attack. Knowing that I had little choice, I led my, son, my men, myself, into the meat grinder. Somehow, we held them at bay for months, but I was wounded in the first charge. I sent a message to Mary, wounded, come at once. She joined me in a few weeks. She found me, my arm and teddy plaster, and resolved that she would join me in the battle. She signed up in the Lincoln Brigade as a corporal, the only woman to serve in that brigade. She was by my side throughout 1937 as the battle wore on. But by the winter of the, that year, I encouraged her to go home to America to raise more support. She was nervous and doubted herself, but I knew Marion could live up support. As she prepared to depart, I sent her away with these words. If I'm killed, I want you to promise you'll marry again. She promised. It was the last thing I ever said to her. I kept fighting for the Spanish Republic, eventually reaching the rank of major and in charge of three battalions of international Spanish soldiers. I would go on fighting at the front until April of 1938, when I disappeared behind enemy lines at the last Battle of Ebro. They never found my body. Mary and remarried and wrote a book about my life entitled The American Commander in Spain. Here's um, uh, Commander uh, Oliver Law is running late for the battle, so we're going to, until he arrives, we're actually going to hear from uh, Bobby Porter, who is reading for us. So let her keep. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said we're going, uh, we're moving on to uh, Corporal Marion uh, Merriman, who's here read by Dr. Roscoe. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Marion Stone Merriman Wachtel, Corporal in the Abraham Lincoln Battalion. I was born in New Mexico in 1909. I was a typical American girl growing up. I took classes at the University of Nevada. That was where I met my husband, Robert Merriman. We got married on the day of our graduation in 1932, but soon he had to leave for UC Berkeley where he would pursue a doctorate in economics. I stayed in Nevada a few months to keep my job and care for my family, but I would soon join Bob in a one-room studio apartment in the San Francisco area. My husband was always a kind and generous soul. I remember how he would take people into our home who had nowhere else to go. 
including my two younger sisters. There was no shortage of people in need in those days. The country was in the midst of a great depression, and everywhere around us was a nation in disarray. Nearly a quarter of the country was unemployed, factories sat idle, crops rotted in the fields for lack of buyers. Even those who could work were suffering. Bob worked at a Ford plant in Richmond, and he talked about the deprivations of his fellow laborers. They didn't have bathroom breaks and frequently got struck by battery acid. You couldn't help but wonder if there's a better way. My husband and I never considered ourselves communists, but we couldn't deny they were doing something. In the 1930s, there was an American Communist Party, and we read about the Soviet Union in the papers. We were impressed by the stories of the vast improvements to the lives of the regular people. How the literacy rate was skyrocketing, and more schools, factories, and farms were being built every day. It was inevitable that Robert would want to journey to this amazing place. In 1935, Berkeley granted him a scholarship to study in Moscow, and I happily accompanied him. It was a little sad to leave my sisters behind, but we made sure they were well cared for. The Soviet Union in 1935 was such an amazing place. I quickly made friends among the American ex expatriate community. Thousands of men and women were eager to participate in a revolutionary new system. It's true that I heard about mass starvation in the Ukraine and how people would occasionally disappear. Even the charming Russian couple who lent us rooms seemed nervous sometimes. But I never really questioned it. I suppose, like Robert, I didn't want to break the illusion. For all the things I heard, there was still the amazing things I would see while living in Moscow. But one thing none of us could ignore during our time in Russia was the news coming out of Europe. We read about Mussolini deliberately invading Ethiopia and how Hitler was riling up the German people against the Jews and socialists. We saw how the fascists usurped the rightfully elected Republic of Spain. We watched the democracies of the West sit back and do nothing, while the fascists sent legions of troops and supplies to Franco's forces. Bob was so moved that, to do something that he went to serve in the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. The time passed, and then, got, then I got the dreaded message, wounded, come at once. I rushed over by train, sneaking through France to Barcelona to find my husband in March of 1937. I tended to him and joined the brigade as a corporal so that I could remain with Bob. I kept the records of the 15th Brigade as well as personal records for my husband and myself. I also wrote for the National Brigade's newspaper and worked as a liaison with visiting journalists, politicians, and other important visitors. My goal and Bob's was to bring in new supporters to the cause. We wanted the U.S. to raise the embargo and maybe join the fight against fascism. Eight months later, I left Spain. I didn't want to leave Bob, but he convinced me that I would serve the cause best by rallying support, direct support for it directly in the States. He was certain my interviews and speaking tour would be the best thing I could do for the brigade to raise awareness and support and ultimately lift the embargo. The troops needed food, clothing, and most importantly, ammunition. Bob's final words to me were, I want you to promise me one thing. If I'm killed, you'll marry again. By December of 1937, I was in New York. I started traveling the country, spreading the word about the war in Spain and the need to support the brigade and the fight against fascism. All around, I could see that support was growing. In those days, the American Communist Party was an enormous force in America, as many Americans remember their tireless work to fight the Depression organizing community projects, and forcing employers to negotiate for better working conditions. By 1938, millions were calling for the government 
to supply the Republic with weapons and supplies to fight against Franco's forces. For a brief time, it seemed to might be, for a brief time it seemed to might be, there were rumors Roosevelt was going to lift the embargo, but those hopes were cruelly dashed when I learned that despite my voice and thousands of others, the pro-fascist supporters convinced the president to stay the course. All the time, worse news came in from the front. The gains at Teruel were reversed as Franco's forces, flush with Hitler's war materials and Mussolini's troops, pushed our brigade back. But the cruelest blow was the news that my dear beloved husband disappeared while leading a retreat to the Ebro. Despite conflicting information, I was certain of his death. The fascists shot all officers. With heavy heart, I continued my efforts to gain tangible material support for my comrades. But by the spring of 39, the war was declared over. Britain and France recognized nationalist Spain under Franco. No support was coming. The only bright spot was several months before the end, Barcelona had organized a full withdrawal of the international brigades, including the remaining 200 Americans. After the Spanish War, I watched as Hitler's war machine plowed through Europe. I retreated to California, and two years later met and married my second husband, Emile Wachtel. Over the years, I endured constant abuse from the FBI, who never let me forget I was a communist, thus an enemy of the American way. I stayed my ground and remained friends with my fellow comrades. Emil and I had three sons, Will, Jeff, and Joe. In my later years, I wrote a book, American Commander in Spain, about Bob and his role in the Spanish War. I visited Spain three times with Emil and fellow veterans after the fall of Franco. I could never find details about Bob's death. Next is uh, Bobby Porter as Solera Key. Hello, everyone. All right, so we're, we're split on the pronunciation of the name. So you said it one way, but I heard it another way. So I'm going to go with Solaria because that's what I heard. So we're good? Okay. All right. Okay, so I want to get it right. All right. My name is Solaria Key. I was born in Georgia on July 13, 1913, and at 25 years old, I decided to head off to Spain to serve for the International Brigades during the Spanish Civil War. Growing up as a young African-American woman in the 20th century, I faced many obstacles due to my race. I was denied acceptance into nursing schools because I was black. The only one I was accepted to was Harlem Hospital Training School, where I would graduate in 1934. During my career, I became captivated by news abroad that Mussolini's troops had invaded Ethiopia. This controversy led me to start exercising my political activism, and I began to get involved in several progressive groups. One of the groups I joined was the Communist Party. Once I found out Mussolini was sending troops that in, had invaded Ethiopia to Spain, I knew I needed to commit myself to helping soldiers in need. In 1938, I arrived in Spain, and I was the first African-American nurse to volunteer from the United States. I was assigned immediately to work at an American hospital in Villa Paz. The political problems in Spain became dear to my heart because I witnessed and experienced parallels in racism and mistreatment among minority groups, similar to my experiences in the United States. I quickly moved up to be the head nurse of the ward, and for the first time, I had five white nurses working under me. Spain became the first place I was not discriminated against for my race. One soldier I treated, John Patrick O'Reilly, captured my heart and became my husband. John was from Ireland and was serving in the British International Unit 
And in order for us to go back and start a life in the United States, we married at the hospital, excuse me, the hospital in Vila Paz on May 1st, 1927. In April 1938, they moved my medical unit to work the frontline base hospital at Pueblo de Canada, where I would treat, where I would help treat hundreds of soldiers. We had to evacuate many of our hospital contingents, and this made us spend many days wandering the countryside to set up our next field hospital. During one of the days, I found myself lost from my medical unit and was wandering alone through the countryside trying to get to Saragossa, and I was captured by the Germans and the Nationalist Army. I was held prisoner for six weeks while I was interrogated almost every day. Finally, one day, the International Brigade took over that village I was held captive in, and the Germans quickly evacuated. I was finally free. Soon after, I was assigned to different units in Aragon, Lerida, and Barcelona. Disaster struck when I was in Barcelona. Our field hospital suffered a heavy bombing, and I was badly wounded. My injuries were so severe, I was transferred to France, where I recuperated and decided it was best for me to head back to the United States in May 1938. When I got home, I published a pamphlet, Salary a Key, a Negro Nurse in Republican Spain, where I talked about, how, where I talked about my experiences in Spain. Finally, in 1940, after a long immigration process, John was finally able to make the move to the United States, and we, decided, and we decided to start our lives in New York. When I was home, I had the opportunity to tour the United States as a guest lecturer for groups that were raising funds for the American Medical Bureau and the International Brigades. I was able to begin raising my own money to recruit volunteers to help defend the popular front. My husband went off to fight in World War II, and I decided to go serve in the Army Nurse Corps in the last months of the war. Later on in life, I continued to work at hospitals, where I coordinated staff desegregation, and I taught classes for nurses and nurses' aides. My husband and I never had kids, and I eventually retired in 1973, where John and I moved to Akron, Ohio. I passed away in Ohio on May 18, 1990. All right, next we have Javier Bayari, who is the Ambassador and Consul General of Spain in Los Angeles, and he's reading for George Orwell. in Modi here in British India, now it's just called India. I was fortunate to, to have grown up in a wealthy household. My great great grandfather was a country gentleman and married my great grandmother, the daughter of the Earl of Westmoreland, which allowed her to meditate an income from plantations in Jamaica. My family was sort of a lower, lower, upper middle class. Although I was born in India, after one year my mother took me, took me and my sisters to England and I did not see my father much after that. My mother insisted I get a proper education and wanted to enroll me in a convent school. However, we could not afford the fees and we were hopeful in scholarships. Luckily, I became quite good at golf and received several scholarships to attend the school. Unfortunately, my peers had noticed that I was from a poorer home and made fun of me throughout my years at school. It was this moment that sparked my rage, my rage, sorry, against social classes. My interest in writing began when I had met a friend through my mother's close friend named Hafid. Hafid and I, used to write poetry together, and had always dreamed of becoming writers. Once I started attending some Cyprian's 
school, I began to write poems again. I even had two of them published in the local paper. I never was able to keep good grades, but I did enjoy writing. Once I had heard what was happening in Spain, I felt the need to go. Therefore, I volunteered in the Spanish Civil War in the Marxist PUM, Partido Obrero de Unificación Marxista, group starting in 1936. I had served as a police officer in Burma under the Indian Imperial Force. Therefore, my background provided me with the necessary skills to fight in the Spanish Civil War. After returning, after returning to England from my time in Burma, I took up work in a local bookstore. It was there that my love for literature flourished once again. It was at the time I began working a book called A Clergyman's Daughter, at the same time as when I met my wife Eileen Oshognesi. Oshognesi. England eventually became a weary place, and I became dismissive of the backward society that had developed in the past five years. The hardworking were oppressed, and the oppressors were hardly working at all. An overwhelming sense of discomfort came over me, and I refused to stay any longer in England. I headed for Barcelona, or for Barcelona, as soon as I could, and became stunned by what I experienced there. The working class had complete control over the city. There were red and black flags hung everywhere. Almost everyone was wearing normal middle class clothes. This was queer and moving. There was much in it that I did not understand. In some ways, I did not even like it. But I recognized immediately as a state of affairs worth fighting for. Boom was a militia, however, they lacked proper training and weapons. There was complete equality between the officers and men, which may have contributed to the dismantle of the regime. On May 20th, 1937, my time with Pum came to an end, when I was shot in the throat by a fascist sniper. In the process of my healing and attempting to obtain my papers to return to, return to Britain, the boom was abolished and rumored to have fascist sentiments. Everyone I knew was being arrested or killed. My wife and I had to go on the run and into hiding. The process in returning to England was long and dreadful, perhaps the worst time of my entire life, being accused for the cause I fought desperately against. Eventually, I arrived back to England in July, only to be welcomed by a majority leftist population that denied the reality of the Spanish Civil War. I began then working on a new book, To Tell the Truth About the War, called Homage to Catalonia. However, my previous publishers refused to work with me, and I had to settle for a less known publisher. The book was not a success. No one wanted to read it. And, believe it, and believed I was a fascist supporter for my ties to Pope. My health soon declined shortly after the publication of my book and the doctors feared I had tuberculosis. I sought work with a newspaper covering international news. The outbreak of World War II made me hope for a position covering the war. However, my health issues kept me far away from the front and no publication wanted me as a liability. I wrote for several news publications for topics other than the war, and my eagerness towards battle inspired me to begin writing a new book called Animal Farm. The book was ready to be published in 1944, however, publications refused because it criticized the Allied Soviet Union. It did not matter because in 1945, the book was published and became an instant success, selling out the first two months. After Animal Farm, I continued work with newspaper publications and throughout the war in 1940s, my work solidified my political stance for democratic social socialism. In 1947, I was officially diagnosed with tuberculosis and my health conditions worsened quickly. 
only three years since my diagnosis on January 21st, 1950, my tuberculosis became too much for my body to bear and in my life. Next, we have Elisa Saracino, who's reading for Virginia Cowles. My name is Virginia Cowles. I was born in Battleboro, Vermont on August 24, 1910. I was a relatively well-known debutante in the area, helping me to be well-versed in society. In the 1930s, I began my career in journalism, but was limited to writing for, gossip, for the gossip column in New York and Boston newspapers. I ventured into foreign reporting in 1936 as Spain was calling my name. I was young, only 26, and giving the newspapers something they didn't ask for, a woman's perspective, on something other than shopping, dating, and social life, just, which is just a fancy way of saying gossip. While I had not been attending college and truly had no qualifications as a war correspondent except curiosity, I ended up working with Hearst newspapers, the Daily Telegraph, and the Sunday Times. I won't lie and say that being a woman made my job any easier, but the way my high bills got me around sure persuaded men to offer me extra <coughs> assistance. As this was my first time working in foreign reporting, I wasn't afraid to ask the men to show me the ropes and help me figure out what being a war correspondent entailed, even if it did mean I had to bat my big pretty eyes every once in a while. Tom Delmer and Ernest Hemingway were readily available, of course, <laughs> giving me the chance to catch some action on the front, or even just walking down the Grand Via. I recall the time Tom took me for a walk on the Grand Via to show me around, get a feel for things, you can read that however you like. It was nearly past noon when the shots started to rain down. I had never before felt the sort of fear that sends the blood racing through your veins until that moment. As I was getting more acquainted with journalism, uh, I quickly joined a small group at the Hotel Florida consisting of Hemingway, Matthews, Delmer, and Martha Gellhorn, to name a few. After spending a few months in Spain, I left prepared for Paris, preparing to cover the nationalist side. Unlike many other reporters and correspondents, I found that it was necessary to report from both sides of the war. By having information on both sides, I believe that my approach to the Battle of Terrell offered a more realistic depiction of how successful Franco's forces were, and honestly, how unprepared the Republican forces were. My experience in high society helped me navigate through the culture and formal structures of na nationalist Spain. I was even able to interview Pepe Quintanilla the chief executor, or executioner of Madrid, and I was the first journalist to get nationalist officers to admit that they had bombed Guernica. I left Spain in 1939, moving throughout Europe to cover World War II. As the war went on, I found myself at the Nuremberg rally, leaving me claustrophobic at the moment. But it wasn't until I saw the faces around me and saw the cheer tears streaming down people's cheeks the drums began to grow louder, and suddenly I felt frightened. After the fall of France in 1940, I made my way to London, where I wrote my first book. I published Looking for Trouble in early 1941, hopeful that it would push the United States to enter World War II, even taking the American lecture circuit to convey my country to join. By 1942, I was hired to cover World War II and worked with the United States Ambassador to Britain until 1943. Once the war ended, in 1945, I married Aidan Crawley, a British politician, journalist, television executive, and author. We had three children, two sons, Andrew and Randall, and a daughter, Harriet, who went on to be a commentator for BBC. My career did not end there, as I went on to write and publish historical biographies, 16, actually. At 73, I was diagnosed with terminal emphysema, sorry, I don't like talking about dying, <laughs> given only weeks to live. Aiden took me for a drive through the Sierra de Guadrama, as I wanted to see the mountainous country near Madrid where I had reported the Spanish War. On September 17th in 1983, 
On our way home in France, I passed away in an auto accident, leaving my husband severely injured. This decision to cover the Spanish Civil War, something I was not professionally trained for, uh, changed my line of work for the rest of my life. Now we'll have Jensen Walsh as Ernest Hemingway. You can all hear me, can't you? <laughs> I am Ernest Hemingway. Born to a well-to-do family in Illinois, I had the privilege to participate in numerous sports, such as boxing and football, which sparked a love of wild, masculine things that lasted for my entire life. I began my writing career by contributing to my school's newspaper and volunteering for the Kansas City Star, emulating the decisive style of sports writers. When World War I broke out, I initially attempted to join the Army and Navy but I was rejected for poor eyesight. Still wanting to make a difference, I volunteered as an ambulance driver on the Italian front for the Red Cross, where I was, unfortunately, severely wounded. Afterwards, I became a leading light of the Paris-based art movement known as the Lost Generation, with novels such as The Sun Also Rises and A Farewell to Arms, in which I incorporated my experiences in the war as well as my travels to many countries. One of the, these countries included Spain, whose rich culture and customs, especially bullfighting, I fell in love with as soon as I arrived. When the Spanish Civil War broke out, I did the thing that was most natural to me, and traveled to Spain to cover the Republican side of the fighting on behalf of, on behalf of the Northern American, North American Newspaper Alliance. I hated the rebellion because I saw it as an attack on the Spanish culture that I loved so dearly. I quickly broke into my usual flamboyant stride and set myself to a wide variety of activities, including writing articles on the war, paying for the passage of volunteers to the front, and even aiding in sabotaging railroads for the Republican Army. During my stay, I associated myself with the idealistic young volunteers of the Lincoln Brigade, assembled an entourage of journalists utilizing my inescapable charisma and began, unbeknownst, unbeknownst to my wife at the time, a famous affair with journalist Martha Gellhorn. After co-writing a documentary called The Spanish Earth with fellow novelist Juan Dos pa uh, John Dos Passos, using material gathered by my entourage and I, I presented the film to President Franklin D. Roosevelt and his politically active wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, in the hope that it would sway the president towards intervening on the side of the republic. To aid in this cause, Dos Passos and I downplayed the influence of radical leftist movements in the republic and focused on the public works projects that paralleled the president's own New Deal. However, this attempt would fail, and Roosevelt would continue his policy of non-interventionism which would last until after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. When the Civil War reached its closing, and the Soviet High Command decided to withdraw the International Brigades from Spain, I was most unlike myself. While staying in a Paris hotel, I wept and repeated to Martha the phrase, they can't do it, they can't do it. After the war, I would go on to write a fiction novel drawing from my experiences in the Spanish Civil War, titled For Whom the Bell Tolls. I would also divorce my previous wife and marry my mistress, Martha Gellhorn, who, in turn, I would also divorce in favor of another woman. During World War II, I would repeat my pattern of daring escapades started in the Spanish Civil War, the least of it the least of such adventures, including the time I worked with Allied uh, intelligence agents to impersonate a French resistance officer. Leader. For many, my many achievements in writing, I would win the Nobel Prize in Literature in October 1954. However, while I had accomplished so much, I had much that bothered me. My previously robust health suffered, my eyesight declined, 
I suspected that the FBI was monitoring, monitoring me. I was right. <laughs> and I even began to have difficulties organizing my writing. Life, for me, had lost, seemingly lost its luster. After a long and eventful life, I would go on to shoot myself with my favorite shotgun in my house in 1961. My name is Martha Gelborn. I was born November 8, 1908 in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm the daughter of a suffragist and a German-born gynecologist. My father's side of the family is Jewish and my mother's side is Protestant. I had two brothers. My older brother, Walter, was a law professor at Columbia University. And my little brother, Alfred, was an oncologist and former dean of the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. I graduated from John Burroughs School in St. Louis and enrolled in Bryn Mawr College, several miles away from home. I left school without graduating to pursue a career as a journalist. My first published articles appeared in the New Republic. I was determined to become a foreign correspondent and I spent two years working for the United Press Bureau in Paris. During my time there, I became active in the pacifist movement and later wrote about it. I returned to the United States and met Harry Hopkins with First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. Harry hired me as a field investigator for the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, or FARA for short. This administration was created by President Franklin D. Roosevelt to aid in the war in the Great Depression. I spent the next few years traveling the U.S., reporting on how the Great Depression was affecting people, specifically women. My reports are now part of the official United States government files. Some years later, I went on a Christmas vacation with my family to Key West, Florida. That was where I met a married man and writer, Ernest Hemingway. We became lovers and soon made our way to the war in Spain, where I was hired to report for Collier's Weekly. I was now determined to become a war correspondent. I was fearless and unafraid to trudge in, around in the trenches to experience first-hand accounts of Republican soldiers fighting against Franco's fascists. In one of my novels, The Face of War, I share the experience I had in my hotel in Madrid, which was located near the front line. At first, the shells went over you. You could hear the thud as they left fascist guns. Then you heard them fluttering as they came towards you. As they came closer, the sound went faster and straighter and sharper, and then very fast. You heard the great booming noise when they hit. I wrote to Eleanor asking her to persuade her husband to aid the Republic, but the president wouldn't budge. After Franco won the Spanish Civil War, I covered World War II. I specifically recall my experience hiding in the bathroom of a hospital ship because I had trouble finding passage to the warfront. That ship landed in Normandy on D-Day. I followed the war wherever I could reach it. After the war, I got a new job with the Atlantic Monthly covering the Vietnam War and the Arab-Israel conflict. I have such a passion to write about war that even when I turned 70, I continued to work and cover the civil wars in South America. As for my love life, well, Hemingway and I were lovers for four years before we married. At first, the marriage was wonderful, but he became jealous of my traveling for jobs and once asked me if I was a war correspondent or a wife in his bed. His bitter attitude made our marriage contentious. Four years after we made our vows, I divorced and left him. I despise that I am known as Hemingway's third wife. I have no intention of being a footnote in someone else's life. During and after my marriage with Hemingway, I had a few lovers before I met former managing editor of Time Magazine, T.S. Matthews. We were married for nine years and divorced in 1963. Before I met Matthews, I adopted an Italian boy named Sandy. I was a devoted mother, but our relationship has been strained because of my job assignments and constant traveling for jobs. Eventually, my brother Alfred adopted him. I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer in my 80s, and it eventually spread to my liver. I was also nearly blind. 
On February 15, 1998, I committed suicide in London by swallowing a cyanide capsule. I was 89 years old. A year later, the Martha Gellhorn Prize for Journalism was established. I was also honored by being recognized along with four other 20th century journalists. The five of us are featured on a postage stamp series. My life's work has also been honored through television shows, novels, and movies. Thank you. Next we have Sierra Sampson, who's reading for Gerda Tarum. My name is Gerda Tarum. I was born Gerda with a T on August 1st, 1910, to a middle-class Jewish family in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. I'm a German Jew who holds a Polish passport. I attended Queen Charlotte High School and then went on to a business college. When I was 19, my family moved to Leipzig, where I quickly became disillusioned with the National Socialist German Workers' Party, better known as the Nazi Party. At the age of 23, I was imprisoned because of my participation in anti-fascist actions and my open criticism of Adolf Hitler. I got caught trying to distribute propaganda against the Nazi Party. Before too long, my entire family was forced to leave Germany, and it split my family up for good. My brothers went to England, and my parents went to mandatory Palestine. I made the decision to move to Paris. After meeting Andre Friedman, I took up photography and created a career for myself. I became his personal assistant and began to work as a picture editor at Alliance Photo. At the age of 26, I earned my very first photojournalism credential. At this time, Andre and I decided to work under the alias of Robert Kappa. Robert Kappa was a joint venture where we both took photographs and published under one name that had a better political connotation than ours did. We chose the name Kappa because it was Andre's nickname on the street and it was Hungarian for shark. I also changed my name and chose Gerda Taro, Gerda with the D, because I liked the work of Taro Okamoto, a Japanese avant-garde artist. It was because of Andre that I ended up in Spain along with fellow photographer David Seymour. It's quite clear what pictures I took and what pictures Andre took because my camera took square photographs while his took rectangles. Eventually, I felt the need to break free from the Robert Kappa alias and, created, and create a name for myself. Because I was working together under Robert, most of my photographs were going uncredited, so I decided to work separately for the French communist paper Sissoir and get the credit I deserved. It was more than just a way to gain credit for my name, though. It was a way for me to discover who I was as a photographer without Robert Kappa hanging over me. I reported on the Valencia bombing by myself, and these turned out to be my most popular images. My images were the only proof that the Republican forces had forced out the nationalists after nationalist propaganda claimed that they had control of the region. According to my biographer, due to the time I have spent entrenched on the front lines, I have many representations ranging from good to bad. For some, I was a saint and a martyr. For others, I was a femme fatale and whore. For me, I was a photojournalist. My images have said to be present, or my images have said to present, and I quote, slices of Spanish reality traversed by universal call against fascism, end quote. My love for the Spanish Civil War stemmed from the fact that it was a culmination of all the antagonisms I had been fighting up against my life until that point. My reckless attitude on the front line has said to be the ultimate attempt at convincing non-interventionist forces of the forthcoming fascist destruction. I ended up covering the Republican Army's retreat at the Battle of Brunete. During the retreat, I jumped on the footboard of a car carrying wounded soldiers and was critically wounded when a Republican tank crashed into the side of the car. Although my images got out to the world, I was the first female photojournalist to be killed while in the field. All right, I'd like to take the time now to welcome Dr. Chris Brown. He will be reading for Battalion Commander Oliver Long. Good afternoon. My name is Oliver Long. Too. <laughs> I was born in West Texas on October 23rd, 1900. 
At the youthful age of 18, I enlisted in the United States Army, serving with the 24th Infantry Regiment, better known as one of the Buffalo Soldier Regiments, where I conducted security operations at the Southern Mexico-American border. Having served with the Buffalo Soldiers for four years, I would be honorably discharged in 1925. After my military separation, I moved to Bluffton, Indiana, where I worked in the cemetery factory. Once having grown tired of plant work, I moved to Chicago, Illinois, where I became a taxi cab driver for the Yellow Cab Taxi Company. Around 1929, a severe worldwide economic depression would force myself to find employment elsewhere. While barely surviving and falling into and out of unemployment, I discovered a profession as a stevedore, better known as waterfront manual labor, working within the shipyards. There I would become a member of the International Longshoremen Association. After a stint in the waterways industry, I made an attempt to own a small restaurant, in which unfortunately soon ended in failure. Shortly after, I would join a New Deal program known as the Works Progress Administration, where I was employed for the construction of public buildings and roadways. In 1932, I became a member of the International Labor Defense and joined the United States of America Communist Party. There, I would begin my tracks as a civil rights activist and share my personal views on political events. During these events, I met my soon-to-be wife, Corinne Butler Lightfoot, who was better known as the mother of the regional communist movement in America. Alongside my wife, we would assist in the facilitating and organizing of mass political rallies across the United States. During a protest in Chicago, where we argued against Italy's occupation of Ethiopia, I would be arrested and spend the night behind bars. The following year, in 1936, I joined the Abraham Lincoln Battalion to fight with the Republicans against Francisco Franco and his nationalist army during the Spanish Civil War. After arriving in Spain on January 16, 1937, aboard the steamship Paris, I would fight alongside my comrades and would perform multiple tasks while quickly rising throughout the ranks. Beginning as a group leader for a machine gun company on the German front, I would quickly promote to selection leader on 27 February 1937. In March, precisely two weeks later, I would be promoted to commander of the machine gun company after a superior of mine was fatally wounded. During the month of April, I would be promoted to the rank of adjutant battalion commander. Seeing as my life's greatest achievement at the end of June 1937, I was promoted to acting battalion commander. There I would hold the helm and lead the Abraham Lincoln Battalion into Battle of Renan. During this conflict, I was responsible for the direct control of 80,000 Republican soldiers. I would become the first African American to lead an integrated military force against an enemy in American history. On July 9, 1937, while leading men into the attack against Franco, Francisco Franco's reserve army onto Mosquito Hill, I would suffer a minor flesh wound. While being carried off the battlefield via stretcher, a sniper would seal my fate with a round to the groin, piercing my femoral artery. On November 21st, 1987, 50 years after my death, Chicago Mayor Harold Washington declared this day Oliver Law and Abraham Lincoln Brigade Day. Thank you. All right, next we're going to have the presentations of our primary sources, uh, showing off some of what we have here in the camera store collection. The first primary source we would like to explain today is the Volunteer for Liberty. The Volunteer for Liberty was published in Spain by the Commissariat of the International Brigades. Volume 1 is 
was printed in Madrid, and volume two was printed in Barcelona. It was printed between uh, 1937 and 1938 in both English and Spanish for both the uh, English and Spanish-speaking volunteers in the brigade. Within the collection, there is one box containing three folders and one book of its published articles. One of the folders in the book being presented in the table over there. Uh, the newspaper was pro-Spanish Republic with a focus on the international volunteer and overall the anti-fascist action. For example, there is the Pledge of the International Brigade, uh, articles about American and Canadian volunteers, and discussion on how Spain will not fall to fascism. The magazine was meant to provide background articles for the current situation and serious new articles. Numerous articles for describing the present situation that the volunteers had found themselves in. Uh, also to report news from American Britain to keep uh, the volunteers up to date on the things happening at home. And the newspaper encouraged readers to submit articles, political cartoons, and songs to uh, help kill time in the trenches. The this magazine was meant to reinforce the volunteers' anti-fascist belief, keep up morale so that they could continue to fight, and portray them as heroes fighting for the soul of Spain against the nationalist army. So the uh, next following artifacts can be found over in that back corner right there with these. Right. Here presented is an artifact from the One Big Union Monthly. The One Big Union Monthly was originally published in 1919 through 1920 as a volume within the Industrial Workers of the World, which was a U.S. Revolutionary Union. It was later recirculated in 1937 through 1938 during the Spanish Civil War. As you can see here, the image is very sensitive and graphic. The intentions of the bombing of Madrid by Franco's German Condor Legion were not simply into targeting of enemy positions. These children had been seen playing in the street just prior to the massacre. The image shown was used by One Big Union Monthly as propaganda to discourage supply shipments to the nationalists from U.S. ports. Again, here's another artifact from the One Big Union Monthly. This is a published biography of Francisco Ascasio. He was a founding member of the Anarchist National Confederation of Trabajo Waiter Syndicate at the age of 15. It is believed that he assisted in the assassination of Cardinal Soldeville, who was adamantly against the proletariat class. Escaso is also believed to have assisted in the robbing of the Bank of Spain. Because of these actions, he was imprisoned three times. Two of those times, he awaited execution but narrowly escaped on both accounts. Later on, along with fellow members of the CNT, they attempted to assassinate the King of Spain, Alfonso XIII. Escaso would die July 20, 1936, fighting against Franco's coup in Barcelona. Here presented is an artifact from The Nation. The Nation is the oldest continuously published weekly magazine in the United States, July 6, 1865 to present day. That's just shy of 154 years. The Nation is most notable for its leftist, progressive, political, and cultural news, opinions, and analysis. The image provided speaks volumes for itself and the Catholic Church's support towards the fascist takeover of Spain. Among some of the photographed dignitaries included are the bishops of Lugo and Madrid, Archbishop of Santiago, Canon of Santiago, and Franco's generals Aranda and Devila. Thank you. on the middle table on you guys' right. Um, and basically, this uh, magazine, um, it covered the Civil War by supporting the nationalists and the leader, Francisco Franco. Uh, the magazine is constantly praised Franco, uh, talk about the children of Spain that were evacuated into the Civil War, or mostly discuss uh, the political aspect of the war uh, by supporting the Francisco dictatorship. The image in the middle, um, the, the image in the middle, it's, 
is the coat of arms on the Franco displaying the motto Una Grande and Libre, meaning the one, great, and free, also showing the rule period of the Kingdom of Spain from 1936 to 1939. The two images on the left on the first slide, yeah, the two images on the left, um, they show uh, the happiness of the children due to the return home after being evacuated from England for so long, describing the journey and experiences of the children. The image on the top right, uh, it asks its audiences to contribute to the American Spanish Relief Fund in able to help the Spanish children from sickness and dangers of the Civil War. Um, the name of this source, it's, um, it's different magazine titled Spain, uh, a semi-monthly publication of Spanish Civil War events. We currently have 26 issues available in our, in our school's archives that go from July 18, 1936 to um, October 1st, 1939. This store was published in New York twice a month for between 12 to 17 cents per issue. The magazines were also published in English and different sections are also in Spanish. The Spain magazine was published and edited by Joseph and Bio and also others, but not much is known about, um, about their publisher. It is likely that the publishers were working for the Catholic Church in New York because of the continued support and dates following the military coup. Other examples, of, other examples of national support is shown in these images. Uh, the image on the left is one of many anti-communist propaganda that labels communists as savages by displaying the arrival of the communists to rest Spain. Uh, with luggages titled Hunger, Assassination, Devastation, Vandalism, Destruction, and Ruin. The image on the middle is a passage that describes uh, the members of the International Brigade as mercenaries who have gotten completely out of hand by threatening the office of the Barcelona regime. The image on the right, it's one of many depictions of the anti-clerical desecration of churches that show different uh, destroyed churches, statues. Um, the magazines exhibited anti-clerical tendencies to justify the rising of a crusade against anarchism and communism. Lastly, the magazines are important sources because it shows the Americans' perspective on the war and it makes it easy to understand why the non-intervention plan continued to be supported by many Americans. The source constantly creates negative attitudes toward the Lincoln Brigade on, uh, members and volunteers, uh, and it provides many profoundal arguments, like displaying anti-red movements to bring down the true Spain, the Red Spain. The source shows the desecration of religious places and objects by Republicans. It uses children to show the struggle within Spain to support the nationalist size and label all the Lincoln Brigades as foreigners or mercenaries. Hello. Okay, so this primary source is called the Fight, which is located on the back left table right there. Um, the Fight, the primary source, um, there's only about four to five magazines in this collection, and these magazines contain stories and photos about the Spanish Civil War. The American League Against War and Fascism published the fight. In 1937, the League changed their name to the American League for Peace and Democracy. Head of this organization was a gentleman known as Reverend Dr. Harry F. Ward. The fight was published from 1933 to 1938 in New York City. There are eight main sections of this fight magazine. The first section is Building the League section. Second is In Step to the Labor section. Three is Youth Notes. The fourth is As to Women section. The fifth is Radio. Six Movies. Seven Books. And eight, A Wall Street section. The fight was significant because the League was against class systems. They felt class, dis class systems only benefited the upper and working classes. They were also against fascism because they felt fascism breed war. In 1933, the yearly subscription was only 50 cents, and single copies were only 5 cents. Uh, we chose to, uh, we did, uh, we're going to do a, a presentation on the Republican magazines, and we chose to do, uh, to do it on the one called the New Masses. Uh, New Masses was a Marxist magazine oh, and it was uh, founded in New York City in 1926. It offered a leftist perspective on politics and culture and it published, it published pro-Spanish Republic articles. 
uh, with the intention of drawing support from Americans for the Spanish Republic. And um, we have many issues in our archive that cover topics from uh, from uh, foreign policy to uh, major battles. And uh, it was widely circulated and published from, published from 1926 to 1948. Um, and we have, in our collection, we have issues uh, spanning from 1936 to 1939, which is the duration of the war. Um, and these are, these are the articles that we have. They can be found on this table right here. Uh, the first one's called An Embargo on Democracy. It was published in January 26, 1937, uh, and it criticizes the arms embargo placed on the Spanish Republic. And uh, the next one we have is Yanks Under Fire in Spain, and that one details the uh, exploits of the Lincoln Brigade at the Battle of Arama. And um, we have uh, one of the other articles is called uh, Fascism is a Lie, and it was written by our good friend uh, Ernest Hemingway over there. <laughs> and uh, it explains to writers of the world why they should be united against, the fire, against fascism. And uh, the New Masses is also known for publishing art in each uh, article, or each journal, I should say. And uh, we have one of those on display for you right there. And you can find it right there as well. And, uh, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> so my group had the privilege of uh, reading letters to veterans, which are located to your left up front. In the archives, there are over 85 letters from about 45 different veterans. We do not have a copy of what Professor Stewart was asking these veterans. There are some veterans that gave very detailed answers and actually continue to trade correspondence with Mr. Stewart beyond the questions he asked. Um, from the answers the veterans were giving, it seems like some of the questions being asked were reasons for having joined the brigade, um, how many American men joined altogether, how many African Americans had joined, and reasons for having lost the war among many more questions. My group, just to highlight three men that stuck out to us the most. Alba Bessi um, is a very interesting character as he was one of the veterans chosen, chosen by Harry Poschild to add to his book, Spain in Our Hearts, where his portrayal is very different from his answers and his letters. Bessi and Cameron um, traded correspondence for about three years before and became pen pals. He wrote many books throughout his lifetime uh, pertaining to the Spanish Civil War as well as edited many books and scripts for others. He claimed that there were too many people writing books about the Spanish Civil War, and it had become an overcrowded field. Next we have Edward Balaga. Edward Balaga's involve involvement in the war is very intriguing because he was a spy that acted against orders and joined the brigades. He used many pseudonames, Edward Balaga being one of them, and is listed in the veterans of the American Lincoln Brigade side as Edward Ford which is how Cameron was able to contact him. He vouched for Worrell's account of events in his books despite never having met him. Palaga wrote about vivid memories from the front, which not many veterans chose to write about. He explained the conditions in which there were not enough arms to go around, uniforms were scarce, and many did not even have some that fit. Lastly, we have Milton Wood. He was the last commander of the Lincoln Battalion after the death of Robert Merriman. He was successful in leading the battalion, and the men respected him. Wolf met Hemingway during the war and regarded him as childish and wanting to be a martyr for writers. He wrote many books throughout his lifetime and regarded very highly of himself. He was loved by the Spanish people for his war efforts and told the Spaniards that if they ever get into any trouble, give him a call. <laughs> We're going to take a five minute intermission real quick. Uh, I'll be turning over the MC over to Byron. Um, we do have some refreshments and water in the back right hand corner. And once we come back from intermission, uh, our local commissar, Matt Ehrlich, will give, our first, give his presentation. Thank you. Okay, so first up, we're going to have Ehrlich here in, our, in that wonderful <coughs> costume. Uh, he's going to be doing his wonderful impression of a commissar. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so the following biographical details are a fictional composite. Uh, any resemblance to real historical individuals is strictly intentional. <laughs> um, my name is Matthew Ehrlich. 
Uh, I'm an American citizen. I was born to a, uh, a rabbi, actually, who immigrated from uh, Romania. I was born in Butte, Montana, and you don't really think of our tribe existing out there, but uh, during the copper boom in the late 1890s, uh, that was a place where people from all over the world were coming. Um, so he was a rabbi, he was also a kosher butcher. I decided to get out of Butte, Montana as soon as I was able to, and I spent some time wandering around the uh, U.S. Southwest in California in the Central Valley. Uh, you might say I was something of a, like a Yiddish cowboy. Uh, and while I was wandering around there uh, in the early 1930s, um, I saw all the struggles of the itinerant workers, the Okies, coming from the Dust Bowl, uh, racial inequality among Mexican laborers, uh, real bad situations down there in the Central Valley. And I uh, ended up deciding to uh, enroll at the University of Southern California, uh, studying history, and uh, that gave me uh, exposure to uh, the works of Karl Marx. I read Capital over a summer, uh, a number of other of his works, and it really seemed to make sense. Um, so I started studying that, and actually from a Spanish perspective. Um, unlike a lot of the other volunteers here in the Abraham Lincoln Battalion, I actually do know something about Spain. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. Um, I arrived in Spain to fight for the Republic in uh, early 1937 uh, on board the SS Normandy. We went over from New York to Paris and then over the Pyrenees to uh, Albacete, our training camp. I fought at uh, Harama, at Brunete, at Quinto, at Belchite, Puentes del Ebro, Teruel, the Great Retreats, uh, and of course the uh, desperate and heroic crossing of the Ebro River. Um, my own life, I think, is pretty insignificant in the grand scheme of things. I'm just one cog in the great machinery of the working class. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing here in Spain. Um, Spaniards have suffered for hundreds of years under the yoke of absolutist monarchism, an intolerant, intransigent church, and an economic oligarchy that stifled all developments. So, although many of us are communists, myself included, um, we're not here to fight a communist revolution. You know, Marx's materialist conception of history says that first you have to go through the necessary stages, and Spain according to our interpretation, never went through that stage of bourgeois capitalism. So it's perfectly consistent for us to be communists, fighting for what is really a democratic, centrist, liberal uh, government, much like you would have in the United States. And of course later some of us hope that that stage will lead to a communist revolution if we've set the necessary preconditions. But I think we can all agree that fascism is a global menace, and what happens here will send a message to the Italians in Ethiopia, to the Japanese in China, Hitler in Europe, the Ku Kluxers in the U.S. South, that there is no place for them and their ideology on this globe. I'm a political commissar. It's a little bit of a different structure than traditional armies. In this army, we are all equal. Um, but we do realize that decisions still have to be made by those in the know, if you know what I'm saying. It's just like a factory floor, uh, you know, where every man is responsible for one of the components of the machinery. The foremen have to keep the place running on, on track. We're not anarchists. Uh, this is a serious business, and we have to be serious and disciplined about it. Uh, my job as a commissar is to help with morale and help the men really understand the hard political science behind why they're fighting here. Uh, they're not warriors seeking booty like the Mongols. They're not conscripts in some royal struggle for territory. Um, we don't have fancy tanks. We don't have planes. We just have our spirit, our heart, and our education. Um, we're conscious volunteers, the, the vanguard of an idea, and that makes us pretty special. Uh, we're the first integrated army in the world. We're composed of all races, uh, brought together in one cause. And I think not all of us are communists, as I mentioned, but I'd like to think that all of us recognize the uh, uh, organizational role uh, of the Third International. So thank you. I uh, appreciate being here. <laughs> I
my tradition. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, just because uh, I forgot, uh, my name is Byron. I'm also uh, a student in the Spanish Civil War class. I'm the EMC in the second half. So next up is uh, Jacob Serber as George Watt. Whoa, 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 one second. Oh, oh, I didn't. I, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, I went a little ahead of there. Uh, so for real this time, first up is Dr. Dr. Robert McLean, a professor of history, uh, playing as James Newgas. My name is James Neugass, and I'm a member of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade and of the American Medical Bureau. My family and I are well off, middle class, highly educated Jews in New Orleans, Louisiana. I was born on January 29th, 1905. I have traveled to Spain from the comfort of my home in New Orleans in order to fight the rise of fascism with immediate and tangible action, as well as experience adventure and the danger of fighting or at least observing the good fight, on the front lines in Spain. I was formerly a poet and wrote for a newspaper in Paris. When I first arrived in Spain, I was beyond eager to join the fight on the front lines. And although I had no medical skills, I did have basic mechanical skills, as well as a decent grasp of the Spanish language. So I was thrust into the Spanish conflict, playing the role of an ambulance driver. During my time in Spain, I had helped other medical personnel set up field hospitals, mend roads, perform vehicle maintenance, and of course, transport the wounded in medical supplies. I spent many days worrying, waiting for orders at Villa de Paz de Salices. And finally, I was sent out to Teruel with other choppers like myself. I was surrounded by loud shelling and had to scrounge for supplies like wire, and linen and to rule, just to bring it back to the field hospitals. There were times where my comrades and I were forced to hide in the trenches and leave our ambulances on the side of the road to avoid being seen by the Italian and German planes flying overhead. Towards the end of my tour, the Italian, uh, towards the end of my tour, the drives I completed and the destinations I arrived at were becoming increasingly hairy. The main hospital at Via Paz had been moved to Manisa, more north of the Torul Front. The hospital was not safe, as the fascist planes bombed Manisa without restraint. I was the only ambulance driver of five to escape the bombing as I dove into a nearby trench, while the other four drivers hid in a nearby house, which took a direct hit. During the great retreat at Ebro, I was injured by a chunk of shrapnel flying into my back. By the time I had arrived at Barcelona, I was finished with this war, and I wanted to go back to the States and write my book on my experiences in Spain. After my six-month tour in Spain, I had returned to the U.S. to compile my diary entries into a published work. Unfortunately, I did not accomplish this literary feat in my lifetime as my involvement in the Spanish fight for democracy did not go unnoticed by the U.S. government. And I did not want to place my family under the scrutinous lens of anti-communist monitoring by both government entities and neighbors alike. Sixty years after my death, my manuscript of my compiled diary entries, titled War is Beautiful, was published in 2008. It was rather fortuitous that my manuscript had been sent to someone for a review, as my family's basement had flooded. I died on September 17, 1949, from a heart attack, leaving behind my wife, Myra, and my two sons, Paul and Jim. Next up is our uh, wonderful leader, uh, Dr. Hatana uh, Gia, Assistant Professor of History, as uh, my personal favorite, uh, Maria Giacconi. 
Um, don't believe a word uh, what the political commissar said before. <laughs> <laughs> Those communists are here to get us. <laughs> and we're not going to let them. Because it's one dictatorship or another. <laughs> so, I was born on September 26, 1892, in Cave di Sasso Ferrato, Italy, modern day Marques, Italy, to a peasant family. I immigrated to Peckville, Pennsylvania, in 1912, where my brother had established himself previously. I eventually married a fellow emigre from Sasso Ferrato, Adolf Ligi. Adolfo Ligi. Why am I in, on your side his name? Adolfo. Let's call him Adolfo. <laughs> who would introduce me to the anarchist movement. We were heavily surveilled by local authorities who considered us leaders of the nearby Giza, Pennsylvania, Italian mining community. Along with my husband, I went on to heavily participate in multiple campaigns to support my comrades. We participated in Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti's support campaign when they were wrongly, did I say wrongly, murdered by the capitalist state for their belief in the anarchist ideal. We raised money for the assassin Ernesto Bonomini, who injected fear into the hearts of bourgeois swine. <laughs> Lastly, I had a personal correspondence with the Italian anarchist Enrico Malatesta in the last years of his life. During the Great Depression, I moved to Philadelphia and then to New York City where Adolfo was able to get a job as a dog worker. I, it was in New York that I heard of news of the fascist uprising in Spain, but more importantly, the social revolution by our anarchist comrades in the CNT. They had driven out their masters, broken their chains, and fought for a new world free of capitalism, the state, and communism. <laughs> I knew this was the chance we anarchists were waiting for to bring our ideals to fruition. I used my husband's connections at the docks to escape my FBI tail and made my way to Spain to fight, alongside other international anarchist volunteers in the CNT militia. I kept a low profile to protect my family in the United States and Italy from reprisals. My only slip up was in October 1936 when that bastard Mussolini's secret police found me fighting in the Aragon Front. I was likely the only known American woman to have been part of an active fighting unit in the whole of the Spanish Civil War. After fighting with my comrades for a few months, I was able to slip back into New York City in March 1937 I spent the rest of my life living with my daughter and son-in-law, waiting for the day when we can finally topple the kings and capitalists from their thrones and live in true liberty. I died peacefully. <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the seventies, at the end of the seventies in New York City, probably a little bit bitter, but still like very thankful for a life well lived. Thank you. We're going to begin with uh, volunteers from the audience. Uh, our first volunteer is Jacob Serber as George Watt. Thank you for doing this. They're not happy with this, but they are doing it. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jacob Serber. I'm Jacob Serber. I'm Jacob Hello, everyone. My name is George Watt. I was originally born Israel Quat, but I changed my name later in life to try to hide my Jewish Jewish heritage. I was born on November 5, 1913 in New York City. I grew up in East Harlem until my family and I moved to Brooklyn in my youth. While there, I first developed a circle of friends that would go on to become leaders in the student movement as well as communists and socialists. My immigrant father was a strong supporter of socialism as well. My friends and family would be the individuals that would end up influencing my support for communism. I attended Brooklyn College in 1931 and Cooper Union Institute of Technology from 1933 to 1935 to earn a degree, excuse me, to earn a degree in engineering. While attending college, the appeal of communism grew for me. I joined the Young Communist League, and from there felt a calling to defend these ideals on the battlefields of Spain. I pushed others to go, but I was worried about war, and took a long time to decide on whether or not to go myself. But for me, the war was fought on two fronts. 
On the one hand, I was fighting for the defense of communism and leftist ideas to not be wiped out in Spain. However, my Jewish ancestry was also under attack. Franco's nationalists wanted to expel both communism and Judaism completely from Spain. I finally decided I needed to fight and left for Spain on July 24, 1937. I arrived and joined up with the 15th International Brigade as a light machine gunner. I was wounded in the fighting at Fuentes de, de Ebro. I healed and returned to battle, joining with the Lincoln Battalion as the battalion commissar. I took part in the de delaying action that tried to impede Franco's drive to the sea. I was one of the lucky few that was able to escape the fighting by swimming across the Ebro River to safety. But I watched some of my good friends and wounded get carried away by that powerful river's current never to be seen again. With the defenders of Republican Spain all but destroyed, I had no choice but to return home in December of 1938. But the fighting was not over for me. I would go on to continue my war against fascism by joining the U.S. Army Air Corps as a B-17 bomber crew member. My bomber went down in November of 1943 over Belgium, but I was able to escape and return to England, returning through Franco Spain. I wrote a book about the experience called The Comet Connection. Upon my return to America, I continued my work with the American Communist Party. I was one of a group of party officials convicted of sedition in 1953, but the conviction was eventually overturned. I broke with the Communist Party in 1958 to try to keep some peace in my life and for my newly formed family. I married my first wife, Ruth Rosenthal, and we had two sons, Stephen and Daniel. She unfortunately passed away, and I went on to remarry Margaret Weschler, who I would who I would be able to spend the rest of my life with. I received a master's degree in social work from New York University and began working as an administrator at the Community Mental Health Center at Maimonides Hospital in Brooklyn from 1968 until my retirement in 1982. I settled nicely into retirement, living the rest of my life in Northport, Rhode Island. I eventually passed away from cancer in July of 1994, leaving behind a rather large family to continue my legacy. I would never forget the trial by fire I lived through in the fierce fighting in Spain. It would empower my convictions and ideologies that guided the rest of my life. So next up is Ramses Castillo, uh, who is going to be playing David Alfaro Sequeiros. I'm David Alfaro Sequeiros. I'm known by many for my famous paintings as movements and also ideologies. I was born in September 29, 1896 in the city of Santa Rosalia, Mexico, and studied at the San Carlos Academy in Mexico City. My paternal grandparents raised me after my mother died and my grandfather shaped me into a man. In 19, 1914, I joined the rebel Constitution Army to fight against the Victorian Revolta government. And during my years traveling around Mexico, I witnessed the harsh living conditions of my fellow Mexican neighbors. With my discovery of pre-Hispanic art, I decided to travel around the world to show my art and belief. I arrived in Europe in 1919 and worked with my colleague Diego Rivera. After my travels in Europe, I returned to my home country to spread the knowledge of modern significance and politics through my art. Unfortunately, my country did not enjoy my movements and within the Mexican Communist Party sent me into exile in 1930. I traveled to the United States and began spreading my personal views in Los Angeles and later New York. After hearing the tragic events following France, Franco's fascist group, I decided to join the Spanish Republican Army to fight against Francisco's army. In my second return to Spain, I joined the Popular Army of the Spanish Republic, commanded several brigades, and attained the rank of Lieutenant Colonel of the 29th Division. I also earned the title of Coronelazo, or the Great Colonel. My devotion for communism and admiration for Stalin led me to lead an attack on Leon Trotsky. Once I returned to Mexico from, Me from Spain, I planned an attack on Trotsky's home for his views on Marxist, Stalinist ideology. My failed assassination attempt forced me into exile, but I returned home yet again and continued my an anti-fascist work. In 1959, the government of my home country sentenced me to five years in jail for supporting my fellow working men. I continued to support my communist ideology and strongly backed the new Cuban government with Fidel Castro as its leader. In 1966, I was awarded the National Art Prize from the Mexican government, and the following year, I received the Lenin Peace Prize from the Soviet Union. <coughs> after, my display, 
After my display, my work against the U.S. and the war in Vietnam, I spent the rest of my days in Guatemala, Mexico, where I lost my lone battle with cancer and died at the age of 77 in January 6, 1974. Next up is Nate Rowe as John Kisley. Uh, my name is John Kisley. I was born in southern Hungary near the Romanian border in 1909. I came from a Protestant background, but I regarded myself as a free thinker in religion and politics. I wasn't interested in politics at all as a young man, but considered myself socially minded and absolutely against the exploitation of human labor. I went to university to study medicine, and in between studies I had to do compulsory military service, even though we were not allowed to have an army in those years. After my graduation, I decided to volunteer for service in Spain because I had a very boring medical job in Hungary and wanted some adventure. If it could be an adventure for a good cause, all the better. I listened to radio broadcasts from Russia at night, and even though they were somewhat forbidden, they explained the situation of the Spanish, saying the legally elected Popular Front was attacked by rebellious fascists. By this time, I was also aware of the atrocities committed by Hitler and offered my services as a doctor. My parents and friends did not know I was going to Spain. I told them I was going to travel in Italy, see the world outside of Hungary and all that. I thought I'd go to war, and if I survived, I'd be back in six months or a year. I took only enough money to last me two or three months and left the rest with my parents. I told the Spanish consulate in Marseille that I was offering my services as a doctor to the Spanish Republic, and they told me to go away. They didn't want me and said, didn't I know there was a non-intervention policy? As I was leaving the building, another person stopped me and told me to come back after hours when there would be no witnesses. When I returned, I was interviewed at length and admitted. I traveled that night to the Spanish border. The hotel I arrived at was full of international people waiting to be taken to Spain. After two or three days of waiting, a bus took us to the Pyrenees and we hid from convoys of non-intervention patrols. I went from Barcelona to Valencia and was billeted in a rest home for British volunteers. From there, I was sent to the headquarters of the International Brigades at Albacete. It was all very beautiful, and there was no sign of any war. At one point, they asked me if I wanted to be in a Hungarian unit, but I didn't want to since I understood they would be mostly communist, and I was rather non-political. I never met a communist in my life. I declined the French units and opted to go to the British unit in the International Brigade. They sent me up to the front line at Parma and labeled me generally anti-fascist. They told me to keep my nose clean and not get mixed up with suspicious political parties. Triage was part of my responsibilities. Receiving casualties like they were on a conveyor belt. The British doctors adopted me as one of their own and shared some of their tea and cigarettes with me. They called me by the nickname Johnny, and I found myself learning English and Spanish at the same time. At Brunetti, casualties were heavy. Wave after wave of wounded soldiers came in, and we treated them as best we could with limited supplies. I treated a wounded woman, more or less dead when she came to the hospital. I found out much later that she was the wife of the famous photographer, Robert Kappa, uh, Gerda Taro. I didn't have a clue who she was when I was treating her. I was very tired during those days, as I had no time off for over a year and a half. Later, I was loaned to a mixed French and German unit who lost their doctor when they tried to probe the front line. As we went out to the front, we came under very heavy machine gun fire and lost two or three people straight away. I remember trying to bury the dead while the line was retreating. Some wounds were terrible and I had to amputate limbs under a blanket with just a flashlight and surgical scissors. We couldn't use any more light because we were afraid of getting spotted and shot. Later in the war, there was great suspicion between Stalinists and Trotskyites, of which I knew very little. I was reported as a suspicious character and only found out about the extent of the division after the war. 
Some internationals were executed, and I was arrested in Barcelona trying to buy urgent medical supplies on the black market. We were also trying to buy American cigarettes at the street market. I was thrown into a car and driven to the police station. In the middle of the night, two detectives took my camera, drove me near the harbor, and I was sure I was going to be executed. I was instead taken to a crowded police cell for two or three days with no food. My superior finally came and I was released, but was told it was unwise to take photographs in such a delicate situation. I took a holiday in France, and while I was there, the war collapsed. Spain was cut in half, there was no hope of victory, and I decided not to go back then. The next thing I remember, I was in Paris and in contact with the Hungarian consulate. The gentleman there asked me if there was anything I did in Spain that I would be ashamed of. I said absolutely no, and that I was a doctor. Because of my Hungarian military status, I had to ask another gentleman what he thought of my situation before I was allowed to return home. The Hungarian military officer treated me very kindly and told me how good it was that Hungarian youth still had a sense of adventure. Just as I was leaving, he asked me, how is General Franco doing these days? And when I turned around and told him I fought for the Republican side, his mood changed. He stared at me menacingly and told me to just leave and go wherever. So I decided to, not go, back, to go back to Hungary and join my old friends from the International Brigades in Great Britain. I didn't claim to be a refugee, but there were many people coming in those days, and I was admitted along with them. I am married and had a son who later became a lieutenant general in the British Army. I died in 1995, but not before I recorded the history of my service in Spain with the Imperial War Museum. Next up is Daniel Bermudez as Herman Buckley. So you want to know what I did in Spain? Well, let me introduce myself. My name is Herman Johan Treasure Bosher. I was born in Lanzler, Germany. I was orphaned at a young age. My mother died of illness. My father was killed in trenches. My uncle raised me for my adolescence, and uh, he taught me the skills of being a carpenter. Uh, due to the severe economic depression Germany was going through, thanks to the new treaty of Versailles, we moved around Germany and Austria until finally in 1931 I moved to the United States. Uh, I actually settled in San Francisco and began my college studies in sociology at the San Francisco State University. Uh, for work, I worked as a dog hand. Uh, a lot of fine individuals and dogs, a lot of members of the American Communist Party, and I was never a member myself, of course. But I had seen a lot of what had gone on in Germany and Italy with fascism taking off and destroying human rights, thanks to the fine individuals of like Hitler and Mussolini. So when Civil War broke out in Spain, I, I saw the same destructive ideologies crushing a nation, and the part that really hurt me was. It wasn't so much the fact that the United States, Great Britain, France, the other democracies were choosing not to help the Republic in Spain, but the fact they were criminalizing anyone who would help this Republic. I, I just couldn't sit by and watch. So I left my college studies, left my job, and I was one of the first of soon to be many foreign volunteers to go across the Atlantic and fight for Spain. So, my ship sailed Christmas Eve, 1936, and once I arrived in Spain, well, because of my ancestry, they said, well, we can't put you with the Lincoln Mobile. We're going to stick you with the German-speaking Thalmann Battalion. It was there for a little while, before they finally moved on the Lincoln Brigade. And that, that's where things get interesting. I served in several roles during the conflict. First as an infantryman in the trenches, until I got shot in the hand. They pulled me back. But then they asked me, Something I wasn't expecting. They said, can you form a motor pool? Okay, what, what does that entail? Well, form a motor pool. Find trucks, find drivers, put them together, we need to take supplies to and from the front lines. That's what I did. Did that for a while. Eventually, I became a communications commissar and wounded again. Spent more time in the hospital than I carried with me. So I saw countless battlefields. Amara, 
Brunette, ever offensive. Well, he's wounded yet again, pulled off front lines. Well, well the International Brigades withdrew in September 19, 1938. My participation in the war and my association, again, not a member of the Communist Party, just association, prevented me from coming back to the United States until finally in 1939, through some angling, I managed to get my way back to the United States. I got my old job from dock worker back, working with several people I actually served with in Spain. So, well, when the Second World War broke out, the next day after Pearl Harbor was bombed, December 8th, I joined the United States Army to help fight fascism. I was assigned to the Iowa National Guard, so I'm from California, signed up. Iowa National Guard, I know, unusual. And I got sent to the Southwest Pacific, where I am now, fighting at the Bloody Battle of Buna in Northern New Guinea. So, where do I go from here? Well, soon I'll be part of the Liberation of the Philippines, and on New Year's Eve, 1944, I'll be killed in action. My body is now in the Middle National Cemetery for the rest of this day. All right, next up is Kenny Desert uh, as Eddie August Schneider. My name is Eddie August Schneider. I'm an American pilot who fought for the Republic during the Spanish Civil War. But more on that later. I was born on October 20th, 1911, in Manhattan, New York, to Emil Schneider and Inga Pedersen. My family moved out of New York to Jersey City, New Jersey, when I was young. I graduated high school in 1927 at Dickinson High School in Jersey City. 1927 was also a very tough year for my family because that's when my mother died. After her death, my father took our family to Germany to visit some relatives. It was in Germany where I flew in my first plane, and my, my obsession with aviation began. Once I got back to the United States, I quickly worked to get both my pilot's and mechanic's license, which I got in 1929, letting me to become the youngest person in the United States to do so. On July 30th, 1930, when I was 21, I decided that I would fly to the Pacific Coast and back. It took me only 57 hours and 14 minutes, breaking Frank Herbert Goldsboro record of 62 hours and 58 minutes. After setting the record, I participated in the Ford National Reliability Air Tour. I did a tour in 1930 and again in 1931, winning a couple of trophies. In 1932, I married a fellow aviation fanatic, Gretchen Hanna, in New York City. She was the director of the Aviation Club of the New Jersey Journal and Junior Club Magazine. We, met, uh, we had met at an aviation function and we had no children. Then, in 1935, I opened a flying school at the Jersey City Airport. Unfortunately, despite my best efforts to fight for it, it soon became a stadium and I was out of work. Naturally, I began to look for flying jobs, but that became harder and harder. In 1936, a lawyer came up to me with an offer I could not refuse. I was promised to be paid $1,500 to fly for the Spanish Republic Air Force with a $1,000 bonus for every rebel plane I shot down. On November 11th, 1936, I left for Spain to fly in the Yankee Squadron. This squadron consisted of me and a few other American pilots. Here my story coincides with my fellow squadmates. Once I got there, it was clear I was expected to fly and fight without training in planes that should have been in the museum. I flew a beat up Botez 54 bomber during my time there. If, if it was not for the Soviet pilots for flying uh, escort, I surely would have died in Spain, but we did that we did what we were paid to do and flew effectively on the Republic side. After a month of flying in Spain, things were getting more and more difficult and dangerous. Me and a few others had enough of this war. It got to the point that we had to pull, our, pull out our pistols every time we landed because we feared being arrested, arrested on suspicion of being nationalist agents. It didn't help my case when I accidentally turned on the nationalist radio station. We complained to the Spanish Air Ministry, but they did nothing but remind us remind us of our various shortcomings. Finally, after being refused the Christmas leave we were promised, we attempted to escape to France by boat. We were found out and arrested, while the man who was supposed to drive the boat was executed. 
we were released 1800 hours of impris after 1800 hours of imprisonment. I guess the Republic still needed pilots, but in January of 1937, we returned to the U.S. Apparently, the U.S. government demanded us back. Once back, I told a reporter, this was a mess, and there was always that never-ending jockeying for the power among the factions to contend with. It got to the point where we did not know who we were fighting and why. I was never paid for my service, but I was glad to be back in the United States. I had no political motives, motives to, fight, to join the fight. I was broke, hungry, and jobless. The Spanish offer was just too good to refuse. When I got back, I was arrested and questioned by the U.S. government. But after saying I had not forsworn allegiance to the United States, I was set free. I then got a job with American Airlines. In 1940, I was able to sign up for the draft. Apparently, the U.S. military needed pilots too. Sadly, I died on December 23, 1940, at Floyd Bennett Field in a middle collision during a training exercise at the age of 20. Our next speaker will be Ryan T.A. Koyanagi as William Alto. My name is William Eric Alto. I was born in the Bronx, New York on July 30th, 1915. My mother, Elsa Akola, was from Finland and came from an affluent landowning family. She became a communist and had to flee Finland for America when she would have. Once here in the state, she connected with a, or with Finnish communist circles. Taught me to stay in school, my mother married a well-to-do conservative Finnish man named Otto Alto, and he adopted me when I was 12 years old. As I got older, I adopted a similar worldview as my mother because of what she taught me, the struggles I had seen her go through. It was around this time that my stepfather and I started feuding. I also palled around with a Finnish youth club known as the Harlem Proletarians and joined the Bronx Young Communist League. Tragedy struck when my young half-brother Henry passed away. After my little brother's death, tensions with my stepfather only worsened, so I left home and school to find myself. I ended up working odd jobs like truck driving for the for Spain. In 1937, at 21 years old, I left the United States to fight fascism in Spain. Seeing how the world was crumbling around me because of the Great Depression, I had a desire to make my mark on this unforgiving world. So I would leave for the Havre, France, aboard the SS Paris. I crossed into Spain from France, like many of my comrades at the time. Once I was in Spain, I was recruited to be a guerrilla in the International Brigade Collection Point at Albacete. I was recruited because I am 6'2 and very athletic. A college-educated Longshoremen's Union organizer named Alex Kunstlich was also, was also recruited with me. We were trained by the Soviets in demolitions at a school, at a school near Jaén in southern Spain, but they taught us how to use pressure-sensitive explosives so we could sabotage supply lines. After we finished our training, we teamed up with a tough young Communist Party organizer and former acrobat from Brooklyn named Irving Goff. Under the command of Kunstlich, we focused our guerrilla operations on the southern front and in the countrysides of Cordoba and Granada. In 1937, the size of our guerrilla, group, our guerrilla unit grew, and I became Kunstlich's, Kunstlich's second in command. I was responsible for logistics, supply, and strategic command of all our operations. I referred to being guerrilla, though. I had no desire to go over the top, get ripped into by a bayonet, or mowed down by machine gun fire. Our operations consisted heavily of sabotaging fascist infrastructure like railways, roads, and bridges. We could not engage in actual fighting hour because we were often stifled by the lack of arms we had because of the international arms embargo. In 1938, disaster struck. The fascists ripped apart our lines and powered down Aragon to the sea, cutting our fronts in two. On top of that, we lost our comrade Kunstlich. We usually planned everything meticulously, but in the hasty retreat as a result of the fascist offensive, our comrade had a lapse in focus and got himself captured. I believe he was executed near Granada. To try to boost morale, we planned a prison break at the, at the fascist fortress at Motril in southern Spain. It was an amphibious operation. I took 30 men and we were able to free 300 of our comrades from the grips of the fascist stocks. Comrade Goff and I almost lost our lives as we were cut off by fascists and we had to make our escape by swimming out to sea. We were able to swim back to Republican territory, but our comrades who fled with us drowned. In June of 1938, I was promoted to captain, but after the strain of 17 grueling months of combat, I was hospitalized three times with fever, colitis, and malaria between July and November. 
I wrote to the brigade organizers that Goff and I were no longer serving any useful purpose and were better off returning to the States to bring publicity to the cause. I was also financially responsible for my mother and younger half-brother, John. Goff and I were demobilized in Valencia, however the process to get out of Spain would lag and we would not leave Barcelona until February of 1939. Upon returning home, I never spoke of my exploits. Whenever Goff would brag about our adventures behind fascist lines, I found it better to walk away. At home, I would also spend time talking on behalf of the Republican cause, its refugees and prisoners. But in 1942, after the outbreak of World War II, I was recruited to an elite special forces unit known as the Office of Strategic Services, or the OSS. We were to parachute into, or parachute into Europe and liaise with the partisan resistance movements behind fascist lines. I never made it to Europe, however, as in 1943, my world was turned upside down. I came out as a homosexual to my comrade, Irving Goff. Despite all we had been through, he added me to everyone in our unit and questioned my capabilities because of my sexuality. Despite me being more decorated than Goff, he and other Lincolns told me I was a weak link in our unit. After this betrayal, I never spoke to any of my Lincoln comrades again. Our OSS commander, at the request of my former comrades, transferred me out of active service into a training camp in Maryland known as Camp Ritchie. Here I trained young officers in explosives. During a training exercise, a young officer dropped a live grenade. I lunged after it, but before I could throw it, it blew up in my hand, removed my hand and most of my forearm. After this tragic incident, I was discharged from the military with a disability pension. After my discharge, using the GI Bill, I studied poetry at Columbia University, and I published several articles in the Marxist periodical, New Masses. I then traveled to Europe, where I met my lifelong friend, W.H. Hawden. Although I was often in the company of other poets, I drank a little too much and lashed out violent from time to time. In June of 1958, after a turbulent but extraordinary life, I passed away from leukemia and was buried in the Long Island National Cemetery. Our next Lincoln will be Joshua Perez as Delmer Burke. Hello. My name is Delmer Burke. I was born on December 15th, 1915, in the city most of you are familiar with, and I'm. My mother and father were both tenant farmers and always struggled with financial why I left high school in Manteca, California as a junior during the Great Depression to help support my family and my I later moved to Los Angeles where, tempted by recruiters for the military, I joined the National Guard. I legally bought my way out of the Guard for $120 and got a job washing dishes at the Roosevelt Hotel in Hollywood when I saw a billboard advertising for the looking for great recruits. I knew about the situation that was occurring in Spain and I sympathize with the Spanish people who were anyway. suffering because I myself knew how it felt to suffer, which is why I was motivated to fight the Spanish I was also a proud communist, and through the Young Communist League, I enlisted at the age of 21. After cobbling together a bus fare to New York, I boarded the French luxury liner uh, Champagne for France. I would then arrive in Spain on January 1938, crossing the snow-capped French border. I would go on to install communication lines for the front line anti-aircraft artillery near Barcelona, defended the mountain town of Churel, and fought at the Battle of M Ebro, the biggest battle of the Spanish Civil War. Eventually I was wounded that August when Italian bombers missed a railroad station and instead struck a monastery where I and others were belittled. Shrapnel from the bomb remains in my liver, remained in my liver for the rest of my life. After returning from Spain, I joined the the Army and was assigned to anti-aircraft battery in Aguilar. I was later discharged because of the shrapnel wound from fighting in Spain. After the war, I worked as a farm laborer and landscaper and started a cement and stone masonry business with one of my sons. I remained active in politics, however, and would go on to join the Communist Party in the United States of America in 1943. I would eventually become the president of my local chapter of the NAACP, organized farm work workers and protested the Vietnam War and nuclear weapons. I would go on to live the rest of my life with my wife June in Sierra Nevada foothills, where I lived to the young age of 100, which made me the last known living member of the Lincoln Brigade until my death in February of 2016.
Our last Lincoln for tonight will be Ian Fisher as Edward Barsky. I was born in 1895 in New York, where I grew up with five siblings as the son of a doctor. I followed my father's footsteps. I eventually began my career in medicine in 1919 at Beth Israel Hospital, where I became associate surgeon by 1934. In 1935, I joined the Communist Party. And soon, I left my post to provide medical support in the Spanish Civil War in January of 1937. I was one of the founding members of the American Medical Bureau, to aid Spanish democracy, also known as the AMB, where I took an active role in providing medical care and raising funds for the war. This included a short return to the United States in 1937, during which I raised funds from a speaking tour. Providing medical care to Republican soldiers during the Civil War was incredibly difficult, as we lacked supplies and accommodations. After receiving a message alerting my team to the hundreds of injured as the result of the, the Battle of Harama, my team and the townspeople, who we enlisted frantically, worked to transform the schoolhouse into a hospital. Although the addition of new medical volunteers, new supplies, and surprisingly lavish accommodations at a place called Via Paz made life easier as the war progressed, we still continued to struggle with the inadequacies of all sorts. At one point, I was even forced to perform surgery by handheld flashlight. Furthermore, one surgeon and I set the dubious record of operating on patients for 50 hours without sleep. Another difficulty I experienced with the war was that my duties often extended into areas I had no prior experience in. The transportation of medical facilities, patients, and officers was one capacity in which I was woefully underprepared, which I quickly had to compensate for. Learning to immediately leave vehicles and flee perpendicularly at the site of a plane was an important skill to learn for self-preservation. I also found myself sometimes alternating roles with my young driver, Jim Noyes, who we had on earlier, um, who was sometimes so tired that I was afraid he'd fall asleep at the wheel otherwise. In addition, during the war I suffered from Crohn's disease, inflammation of the digestive tract, which made life even more difficult on a soldier's diet. Our medical officers made a variety of advancements that have continued to the modern day over the course of the Civil War. For one, we devised a set of principles which ensured that fractures in the limbs met lower rates of infection and other serious complications. Additionally, we found ways to create an excellent system for blood transfusion, even in desperate circumstances, relying on a measly few thousand donors. There was also some of the first antimicrobial agents and studies on nutritional efficiency. Despite our meager resources, or perhaps even because of them, we were able to make serious advances that have continued to serve patients today. Eventually, I led the sedentary services of the International Brigade, which I would continue leading until our withdrawal in 1939. After the war, I tried to assist Republican refugees with the Joint Anti-Fascist Refugees Committee, J-A-F-R-C, which resulted in being called to testify before the House Un-American Activities Committee, GOAC, in 1947. After refusing to give up the JAFRC's financial records, I was in prison for five months, which resulted in my medical license being suspended, although it was eventually reinstated after a protracted legal battle and additional six month suspension. Once I returned home from war, I wrote a lengthy 400 page manuscript, but never managed to get published. I also married Vita Lauter and had a daughter named Angela. As I grew older, I continued working as a surgeon and joined other progressive causes, such as working with the labor parties nationally and publicly opposing the Vietnam War. I died in 1975, leaving behind a wife and daughter. So, uh, as you can see from our program, we have more Lincolns than time. <laughs> so, um, we have to wrap it up without welcoming all the Lincolns that we initially had intended. But uh, the last words, and uh, for those of you that think that uh, events like this are organized out of thin air, they are not. Here, I want to kind of like 
like pay tribute to the students of uh, 435C Spanish Civil War. Because it's them that did all the work. I'm a good manager, but they did the work. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're going to continue doing this kind of events. Um, right now, after this, uh, this event ends, there's another one. There's going to be a projection of a documentary called No Mas Bebes, No More Babies, about the forced sterilization that Latin American women had to endure in the 60s and 70s in California hospitals. Not by choice. They came to have a baby, they came, went home sterilized. So there's um, a, a projection of the documentary and a question and answer with one of the producers of the documentary. So you can learn more about how history, public history is done. But um, I, I am very happy that you're all here. I hope you had a, a good time and I hope to see you in further events. Thank you.